south, north, south, north. And uh, I, I loved color. We were going through a Great Depression in order to alleviate the drabness and so on. That my mother put up all these colors and, and throw rugs, uh, uh, imitative uh, Persian rugs and things like that. And I realized that that might have led me to look at a person like Matisse more. Considering the violence and pathos of his subject matter, prisons, deserted communities, race riots, Lawrence's images are all the more piercing for their lack of bombast. When he painted a lynching, he left out the dangling body, the jeering crowd. There is only bare earth, an empty noose, and the huddled lump of a grieving woman. There is an Egyptian stillness, freeze-like even when you know the subject was in motion, like that crowd surging into the narrow slot between two railroad cars. The entire series, of course, is a clash, where you're dealing with the, uh, this physical confrontation. Also, the two women, one black and one white at the fountain. It sums up a human experience, uh, that we've faced for 400 years. Two women at the fountain, both look the same, only the color of the skin is different. They both have the same shapes. And here they are as two uh, symbols of a separation, how people relate to and see each other. I would like to think that's a universal symbol and not just a, a, a symbol within the migration itself. But the greatest American artist of the 1930s didn't paint collective experience. A solitary, deeply inhibited man, he focused on lonely people in an indifferent world without much social connection. His name, of course, was Edward Hopper. If you live in New York, you see Edward Hopper everywhere, in a man staring out of a window, in the sunlight on a cornice, in the lobby of a third-class hotel. There hasn't been a painter in the 20th century whose work was more associated with the look and feel of a certain kind of America, a basic America that has nothing to do with the rhetoric of patriotism, but goes much deeper. Earlier artists had painted the frontier, but it was Hopper who saw that the frontier had moved inwards and now lay inside the self, so that the American man of action was replaced by the solitary watcher. He was a man of extreme plainness, straightforwardness, and tact of feeling. He was candid, but his candor always holds a certain mystery. He's a painter that I trust absolutely. Hopper was convinced that, in his words, American art should be weaned from its French mother. But Europe always meant a great deal to him. He was no cultural isolationist. Hopper wanted to capture what he called all the sweltering, tawdry life of the American small town, this sad desolation of our suburban landscape. You can get a sense of the nuances of Hopper's imagination from one of his best-known paintings, Early Sunday Morning. It's a frontal view of a row of stumpy brownstones in New York, too early for people to be up or for traffic to be moving. Silence, stillness, and yet there's an air of expectancy. And Hopper pays so much attention to the exact rake of light and shadow across that band of red brick that you feel yourself drawn into the details. Plus, the buildings seem to go on outside the frame. And so, without alerting you and without telling any kind of a story, he manages to slip a sense of time into his space. There are walls between Hopper's people, transparent but thick. In summer in the city, has she put her clothes on after sex, or has he taken his off to get cool in the New York heat? We don't know. We aren't meant to know. Hopper's peculiar mix of wireism, putting us in the room, and discretion, 
not revealing what they've been doing or thinking, is the hook in the painting. The formality of the picture is signalled by the trapezoids of light and shade cast by the slanting sun through the big bare window. He was, you know, a rather noble, sombre, stately, silent fellow. His wife, Jo, she was a wonderful eccentric who was much underrated in the Harper literature. She's a sophisticated woman, a woman of great character, uh, who uh, kept him alive. He had a wonderful, uninterrupted apprehension of things, which he then put together massively in a Cezanne-like way. He adored Cezanne. And the other great passion was light. He wanted the fall of light everywhere. He watched light. He watched it wherever he could see it, the slanting light, the movie light. So you can imagine Hopper at the movies, looking at the slanting film noir light. The people who still have, in some ways, the deepest sense of what Hopper did and was are cameramen. Cameramen just adore him. That almost objective, stony gaze of his, which projects the picture like a movie. In New York movie, painted in 1939, the spectacle on screen is out of view, and what counts is the boredom of the usherette who's seen it 50 times before. She's dreaming dreams, but are they movie dreams? We don't have a clue. Woman in the Sun is like a Renaissance Annunciation. It's his wife Jo, who was 70 by then, facing the sun stark naked with that blinding shaft of light and shadow printed on the floor. And then the figure vanishes. Four years before he died in 1967, Hopper painted this, Sun in an Empty Room. And that's all it is. But it's like a stage set just after the curtain has gone up, full of anticipation and mystery. There was another artist, though, who, unlike Hopper, portrayed the verve of 1930s America, not its social isolation, using jazz with its racy, optimistic beat. He caught the visual punch of the American street with its signs and life imagined at jazz tempo. In the early 20s, Davis set out to adapt the language of French Cubism to the signs of American life, producing what he sardonically called colonial Cubism. His father was a journalist and cartoonist, and the son would later describe his own role as a cool spectator reporter at an arena of hot events. Accused of aping French painting, he memorably replied, I am as American as any other American painter. Over here, we're racially English American, Irish American, Russian or Jewish American, and artistically, we're Rembrandt American and Picasso American, but since we all live here and paint here, we are, first of all, American. Davis delved images from commercial culture before the pop artists were even born. A classic one is Odol, 1924, in which the bent neck bottle of a mouthwash is presented plain, name brand, slogan and all as its own icon reflected in a bathroom mirror, the ancestor of Andy Warhol's soup cans. Davis's obsession with jazz syncopation and variations on a melodic figure winds into the great housing mural swing landscape in which familiar Davis signs for bridge, girder, ladder, mast and cable jive and flicker in a matrix of energetic colour. In the 1930s, Davis was on the political left. But he was no Stalinist and had little time for the kind of social realism practiced by many in the WPA. In fact, he condemned proletarian imagery as false social content in art, and a big ideological split opened between modernists like Davis and those artists who saw cubism and abstraction as socially irrelevant over the workers' heads. There was a political split that happened. 
and the left really got smashed up a bit. And uh, it seems to me that that uh, to organize on the basis of feeding people or writing social injustice and all that is very valuable. But to rally people in, uh, around the idea of modernism, modernity or something, is simply silly. I mean, I don't know what kind of a cause that is, to be up to date. I think it ultimately leads to fashion and snobbery, and I'm against it. But Davis's enemies were not just on his own turf. Many Americans felt that neither he nor Hopper represented the true America, and they looked for images of an altogether different kind, far from the elitist city. 